levels of impacts to important essential fisheries habitats. Um, and this is work that's been ongoing in, in Mark Peterson's lab for over a decade, and it's stuff that I'm continuing with my dissertation research uh, under his guidance. So as I grew up, my dad always had this thing about managers and administration with this company, and it was you know, this joke of why, do administ why does administration have dimpled chins and flat foreheads? And I've kind of fit in scientists into this as well, you know, because we have a sense of humor. We realize every now and then we, we make mistakes. And, well, we have dimpled chins because we spend a lot of time contemplating and thinking about what certain things mean. And then we make a decision or we make a hypothesis only to find out that maybe we were wrong. And so we, we slap our foreheads. Well, it's really not any different in terms of fisheries management either. Um, it wasn't that long ago. In fact, it was the early 1950s that there were some out there that believed that all the great sea fisheries were essentially inexhaustible and that anything we did to manage them would be just a waste of our time. Okay? And well, we now know that that's not the case. We have to manage fish stocks. We can't just go out and fish them wholeheartedly without any kind of regulation at all. And then around that same time, we also began to realize that it's not just about managing the actual fished stock, but it's also important to manage the habitat as well. That the habitat, particularly for the early life stages of many of these fishes that, that we're actually targeting, you know, these are, this is where a lot of the population dynamics are going on. This is where they grow. This is where they survive during the early life stages. And so today you've heard talks about anadromous fishes such as Gulf sturgeon and such as Alabama shad. Um, but that's not the dominant life history strategy with, uh, with fishes in the Gulf of Mexico and even out in the Atlantic for, for the most part. The dominant life cycle for marine fishes is actually called what's called an estuarine dependent life cycle where the adults are offshore, they spawn their eggs and larvae drift and migrate back into the estuary where they use a variety of habitats, whether it's salt marsh, whether it's seagrass or whether it's mangrove, but they use these, these structurally complex habitats where they can survive, where they can find ample amounts of food, um, and then they can also grow back to a, an appropriate size where they move back out into the adult stock, where they either continue this life cycle or they enter the actual fishery itself. So, despite knowing that there's a strong connection between habitat and fisheries, now what we see is that the coastal zone is one of the most altered habitats in the world. And this is a map taken from, uh, <clears throat> from I believe it's from the UN. Um, and there's a lot going on here, and I'm going to try and walk you through it. First, you'll notice that all the countries are, are different shade of green. Dark green countries like Australia, uh, some of these Middle Eastern countries, or the, the uh, Northern Africa countries, and then Europe in particular, uh, these are countries where over 70% of that country's population lives within 100 kilometers of the shore, okay? And then when you go to a, a little bit lighter shade, the second uh, darkest green, like the United States, we're a country where 30 to 70% of our population lives within 100 kilometers of the shore. And that's actually maybe a little bit misleading because the last estimate I saw was that we have about 60% of our population within, uh, within the immediate vicinity of the shoreline, okay? The blue squares that you see littered throughout the, uh, the map, well, these are selected coastal cities that have a population of greater than one million people, okay? And then you'll notice that some of the shorelines are blue, some are red, like in the United States, and then some of these remote areas are orange, or some of the remote areas are blue, and then some of these some of these other areas are orange. And what that is, is red is, is, is coastal shoreline that's the most altered, blue being the least altered shorelines, okay? So if we zoom in and we just look at the northern Gulf of Mexico and the Atlantic coast, you can see that we have the entire shoreline for, uh, for North America, and it's even true for the Pacific. Um, <clears throat> it's highly altered very altered ecosystems, or very altered systems. And then we have, you know, four or five cities, four cities that have a population of greater than one million people. Now today what I'm going to talk about are three examples um, 
One is a past example in Tampa Bay. One is a present example, which is our own backyard. It would be coastal Mississippi. And then one is actually a future projection of what all of this habitat alteration means to fisheries. So our first example is going to be a past impact, and we're going to focus on the Tampa Bay area. This is a major metropolitan area that has a population of greater than 2 million people, and as you can see from this aerial imagery, Tampa Bay is highly developed. Um, there are very, very little areas that are green. Most of it is a hardened surface throughout the entire, uh, the entire watershed. Um, and, and specifically where we're going to focus is right here on this little island, uh, in, in what's known as Boca Ciega Bay. Now, this island is actually called Tierra Verde Development. Okay, and this is what it looks like now. And this is a very sought-after place to, to have a house. There are, it's, it's, we're actually zoomed out pretty far here, but it, I've actually zoomed in and looked. There are some million-dollar mansions in this place, big, big houses. And it's just a complex network of hardened surfaces, canals. There's very little green. There's very little grass. Okay. Well, this is what it looked like in the late 1950s. Okay. And you can see that nothing there yet, still kind of in the development stages. Well, this is what it was in the early 1950s. It was a giant mangrove island. Okay. And what they did is they decided that they needed more housing development for the Tampa Bay area. So they basically, whoops, back up. They basically clear cut all of this mangrove and then they filled it in with enough dredge spoil. Uh, to build the island, but there was enough dredge spoil there to lay a highway from Tampa to New York City, which is about 1,900 miles, and that highway would be 40 feet wide and 1 feet deep. So a lot of material went into this island. So why do we care? Well, mangroves are an essential nursery habitat for a lot of the fisheries in the Tampa Bay area. And what you see is you see that small juvenile fishes actually live inside of these mangrove prop roots, and they use them as a refuge from, from predators that are out here in the open water. Okay? And now this is, a, uh, <clears throat> this is actually a high-definition sonar image looking into the mangrove prop roots. So right here, this red line is actually the, the prop root edge. Okay? So anything above that is inside the prop roots. Anything below that line is outside the prop roots. And what you see is not a lot of small fish out here outside the edge of the prop root system, but when you look inside, you can see all these little red dots or these red uh, structures moving around. Those are all fish. Okay, those are all juvenile fish of, of one sort or another. Um, so and typically with these systems, it's, you're going to find out that it, it's red fish, it's, it's snook, it's a, it's a form of snapper. So, in Tampa Bay alone, since the 1950s, they've lost over 50% of their mangrove habitat due to development pressures. Uh, and they've also lost over 50% of their available salt marsh habitat as well. Um, now, this has also led to a decline in the amount of seagrass habitat that's available because now you no longer have these natural habitats that are sequestering nutrients and keeping things from running off into the water, you get eutrophication and seagrass beds start to die out due to hypoxia. Okay? Well, at that same time, you had strong, you had very significant declines in the catches of redfish and snook and other fisheries. Okay? But there's good news. You know, this is, Tampa Bay has now become one of the models for coastal zone management. Um, they're actually uh, doing a lot of restoration work trying to restore the amount of available habitat for fisheries, um, and you're actually, they're actually starting to see their catches and the population sizes of some of these species, particularly redfish and snook, they're actually starting to see them rebuild and recover. So now we're going to go to a present impact, okay? And we're going to focus on our backyard, the coastal Mississippi. Over here is Biloxi, over here is Pascagoula. Right now you're currently somewhere in here, Okay, and what you can see is in Biloxi, we have a lot of developed surface. We have a lot of developed space. Um, and same thing with over here in Pascagoula. Um, as we, we talked about with some of the sturgeon stuff earlier, Pascagoula on the east branch is highly developed where the city is, but there's a lot of port facilities down here in the lower uh, Pascagoula. But then when you look at the western branch, it's, it's relatively natural. There's not a lot of development going on there. And it's the same thing with Biloxi. Development over here in the main part and then we have some expanses of natural salt marsh habitat. Okay? 
And that's kind of what we're pointing out here is that this would be a natural salt, mar salt marsh habitat. And I don't know if it's dark enough in here that you can see it. Um, and then this is where there's some development going on, but there is uh, <clears throat> there are some patches of connected salt marsh habitat. And then this is down here in the lower eastern Pascagoula where all of the port facilities are. And you can see that it's highly developed, highly structured shorelines with one little small isolated patch of, of salt marsh habitat. Now, when we look at natural salt marsh habitats, why they're important, you know, they're structurally complex, um, but they're, they're interconnected. So there's a lot of flow of animals and materials in between these patches um, that, that actually drive the ecology of, of these habitats. Now, when you start bulkheading it, what you do is you, you, you eventually you're creating a smaller patch. You're kind of isolating it. So this right here is that on the, on the western side of the Pascagoula that I pointed out earlier, um, and it's, it's highly developed down here with a little bit of development going on here, and then there's a nice big patch of salt marsh that actually extends back up in this way along the creek, and then it feeds into uh, the state park over there in Gautier. Okay, and then this right here would be the main branch of the, of the Pascagoula River. And then when you start adding commercial bulkheads in, um, what you find is, you know, they're very hardened surfaces. There's a lot of runoff, so anything that's on these, say, like a parking lot or anything, all runs off into the marsh. And then the, the small patches, you know, become more and more isolated as you continue to add these structures up. Um, and they have nothing to, they, they're not receiving nutrients, they're not receiving sediments from the, the surrounding watershed, um, and they eventually start eroding. So, the take home here is that as the degree of alteration increases, natural habitat gets smaller and more isolated, okay? So what does this mean to fishes and invertebrates, you know, commercially, ecologically, recreationally important species that a lot of our economy has, has relied on for a long, long time. Well, as the degree of alteration increases, we find that, a num that the number of individual, uh, individuals of important species actually decreases. So for species like the Gulf Menhaden, which is more commonly known as the pogey, um, brown shrimp, which is another very important commercially, or another commercially important species here in the Gulf of Mexico, and then grass shrimp, which is a very important ecological species because many of the things that go up into these marshes are actually feeding on these guys themselves. Um, what we find is that they're just they're four to five times more abundant in habitats like this than they are in these small isolated patches that you find with a lot of development. But then there's the flip side of that. There are a lot of in, there are several individual species that we're finding that don't really change in terms of their numbers in a habitat. You know, species like spot. Southern flounder, the uh, gulf killifish, which a lot of us around here know as the bull minnow, and then blue crab, um, their numbers don't change. So whether they're in a habitat like this or they're in a small little isolated patch like this, their numbers kind of stay the same. Okay? But what we do see then is when we, when we kind of shift our focus to just two species, one being kind of a, a migrant um, estuarine-dependent species, you know, that has that estuarine-dependent lifestyle, life history that I told you about earlier, um, and then the other one being the Gulf killifish, which is actually a resident species. It, it spends its entire life in this marsh system. Okay. What we find is, is that in habitats like these, both species grow exceptionally well. And then when you move into habitats like this, you see changes in their growth. Maybe in the case of spot, what you find is that juveniles are much heavier for a given size than they are in, in this habitat than they are in this habitat, meaning that they're in better condition. It means they're feeding on, on they're, they're feeding better, they're hardier. Um, and then what we find with species like this, uh, like the Gulf killifish, is that as they get older, as they grow larger, their condition actually starts to slow, it actually decreases, so that a bigger fish is actually very, very light compared to a fish over in a natural habitat. So it, it kind of suggests that even though this is a salt marsh, it is not the ecological equivalent, equivalent of, a, of a naturally occurring system.